After falsely screaming for years about the impending housing crash and crisis, the real estate industry news seems to have finally given up predicting anything. And while I think that makes sense, I think the reason is dubious, and I'll show you why. Before we get into that, I'm Bill Gross, and this is my uh, real estate market update. We do this every week, normally on Monday, but with the holiday, we're coming out with the Tuesday version. And we review the real estate market where we are and the headlines going forward. So where are we today? We always start with two things. In any economy, there's two parts. There's supply and demand. Supply would be inventory, how many houses are available to buy from home owners. And demand would be buyers, and we measure that through the interest rates. So that's the thing that most strongly affects interest rates. Let's take a look at the numbers. Interest rates, as you can see, dropped tremendously, closing at 6.66%. That's just from about 8% maybe in October. So in a month and a week, six weeks or so, we've had a tremendous drop in rates over 1%. And while all year long rates starting uh, in the year in the sixes rose up to the sevens, rose over seven, touching the eights, we're now back to where we were back in the summertime. So six months of hand wringing about raising interest rates, might they go to eight, might they go to nine? They might, but as of today, they're at 6.6%, which is getting a lot of buyers back in the market and home buyers who bought just six months ago already refinancing and saving money on their properties. Now on the demand, on the inventory side, the supply side, home sellers have brought a few more homes to the market. We're still below any year ever other than pandemic. And while it's above the pandemic year of 2021, it's still at or below 2020 and 2022. And about half the rate of what we would call a non-pandemic year. So there's less homes for sale. Without more homes for sale, you cannot have home prices dropping. The only way prices drop is when there's more buyers, I'm sorry, more sellers than buyers, and sellers have to compete by lowering price. But with inventory levels so low, that's impossible given the current market condition and isn't going to happen. What's the market like in our local area? Well, Los Angeles, for example, continues to be a fairly healthy, slightly seller's market. The ranking Altos research uses, one of the great resources that I use, is a 40. We've been there for seven weeks in a row now. It had been 42 and 41 earlier this year. Seems to have settled in. One of the key metrics to watch, though, is watch the price per square foot drop to $792 is what it cost to buy the average square foot of home in Los Angeles. Now that's down all year, been 816, as high as 8, uh, 830. So it tells us a couple things. One, more lower price homes are selling than higher price by percentage this time of year. And second, prices are staying about the same. So we have less sales and uh, the number, the prices for homes are selling, less of the high-end homes and more of the lower price Homes are selling. But overall, the market is pretty solid. Medium price is dropping. So that tells you that more lower price houses are coming on the market. Homes are staying in the market a little longer, 118 days versus about 109 days and as low as 97 in the summertime. So homes are staying on the market longer. The medium is now median is now about 70 days. So we have more homes coming on the market slightly and on the market longer slightly. And we should look for that number at 40 to drop to 39 or 38 soon, which will get us closer to our normal buyer's market. We're not there yet, but that seems to be where we're headed. So in the real estate news this week, big story that I don't think got much attention, but it affects all of us. First American Title, uh, their systems got hacked to where they had to stop closing transactions. Now, not only are they the largest title company by percentage, they also underwrite other title companies, and they're one of the two largest that was attacked recently. You put together in over 50% of our title companies have been hacked to the point of stopping transactions just in the last month. And if these companies, which are so financially sound and so tech forward, if they're having problems with their technology, then we individuals must be uh, understand that we are targets as well. And we should all be vigilant about our security as far as our technology, home, finances, what we're using. And both of these apparently were started by phishing attacks, which are an email that comes to you uh, pretending to be from one source when it's not. Somebody clicks on it 
and it gives them access to information. So a good warning for all of us, be extra careful about in, uh, emails coming from trusted sources, apparently, when in fact they are not really trusted sources. The next story was really disappointing for me. You know, I started in this business in 1986. I started the lending business. And I would say in my time, the loan business has become more and more like going to the post office of the 1980s and less like a competitive, vigorous real estate market. There's an article in the Housing Wire this week that says that loan officers are, are cutting their uh, pay to win clients and that that's illegal. And they outline the, the rules of the road now, which is that loan offers individually can't lower the price they offer customers to be competitive to respond. They can't agree to give up part of their commission. What they can do is determine which bucket the loan came to them from. Was it generated from their own leads? Uh, was it corporate generated? Was it created by the branch? Was it created by some sort of organization that they're part of? And each of these have pre-assigned prices. And what loan officers do is typically get lower commissions on the leads they have less impact on, higher commissions than the ones that they have more on. But at the same time, the ones that they have the higher commissions on, the company might uh, want a higher price as well. And so the only way for the loan officers to offer better pricing to customers is change how the lead came in in order to get the customer a better price, they lower their commission, the customer gets a better price. Well, that's great news. It seems to me there should be a market where uh, customers get better pricing, but it shouldn't be illegal. I mean, other than the government, what business makes it illegal to give customers a discount of better price? And we've had so much haranguing about real estate commissions. Literally, it's illegal for loan officers to offer better commissions to their customers out of their own pocket. How can that possibly be? What, what kind of system would create such nonsense? And the answer is the American lending system is broken. And among other things, it's really one of the, one of the least competitive and really serving customers the least, in my opinion. Also, another uh, industry news that I think, again, gets little attention is the constant push of our governments to more dense housing. Here, the Wall Street Journal says facing housing shortages, cities try cramming more units on lots. Now, this is the every government official. You know, by definition, most government officials want power. If you're a government official, how do you have power? Well, you control how people live and how they move. In Los Angeles, the tyrants that, that run the city of Los Angeles, their fantasy is that our city becomes like Manhattan. Everybody lives in high rises, serviced by mass transit, uh, and they can control the flow of goods, control uh, everything. What do people want? People want to have their own home. They want their own share of the American dream. They want their own yard to play in and have their kids play in. It's the cities forcing this high-rise version on us. I was at LAX yesterday coming back from vacation, and our airport now has a transit system to get a Lyft or Uber. And that just seems counterproductive that you can't just now compete with the city transit system and pay a, a third party to give your ride. You have to dutifully get in line, get on a bus. I'm with my wife who's recovering from cancer surgery and carry on luggage. We got to jump on a bus and go to some off, mar uh, off uh, airport lot and wait in line for an Uber. This is the kind of life that our city governments are pushing on. It's these high rise uh, government intensely regulated lies. And here the Wall Street Journal specifies that, whereas I've never heard one customer say they prefer a high-rise house. Uh, maybe I, that's not quite right. Very few in my career have I heard prefer a high-rise to a single-family home. It's some sort of a combination. It's more affordable. Uh, you can live in a location that you could afford a house in that area, something of that nature. But again, the governments are going to be pushing more and more relentlessly, I think, in this area of more intense housing and more dramatic. Another, you know, poor, an example of poor uh, editorial work, I think, is Market Watch. And take a look at this. As I was doing my research for articles this week, or news this week, here's their front page on real estate. And two of the stories of the three, one is, I bought a house with my fiance. She said, I have to pay all the bills. Well, she get half of the house. So here's a article about what happens by buying my fiance. Here's another one. My wife and I are separating. And then, you know, how does the money get split up? And they, is that really the dominant theme in real estate is two of the, the top two articles on Market Watch are about couples separating. And then I also noticed the graphics. In both cases, there's the husband yelling and the wife looking away, almost being abused. I don't know. Like, 
I could talk a lot about what that looks like to me, why that's so wrong. Um, but is that really what real estate is about? Uh, is really about getting separated. And and I think it creates a doubt, like why would I buy a house if I'm going to face that kind of reality? To me, I, so much of the real estate news is negative. It's almost like the same drama I would never watch on television or I would never watch on Netflix is being infused into the news. And it's obviously affecting into the real estate news cycle as well. Now, the real estate um, in industry in the last uh, year or two has been screaming about the housing crash, housing crisis, prices are going to drop. And so at the end of the year, in all industries, you see different predictions for next year. It's interesting that so much of the news this week, I think the real estate industry is just giving up predicting the future. Here's two examples. One is Business Insider. Should you wait for a better deal on the home or jump in now? Here's what housing market economists say. And if you read the article, it says on one hand, you know, uh, falling mortgage rates will cause more demand. Uptick in inventory will cause less demand. Uh, mortgage rates have a limited downside this time around. At the end of this, they, they give this side, that side, this side, that side, and at the end, make no conclusion. So it says, here's what housing market economists say. They never actually give you a prediction. Should you wait or should you jump in now? Another of these genre is Market Insider, a related business insider. And I, and I love this article. Let me see if I get a better picture. Here you go. <laughs> this one's the worst. Home prices may pick up speed after the Fed cuts rates with 88% of the housing still overvalued. So here you have an article that's predicting housing prices won't just increase, but the rate of increase will go up. They're going to go up faster, but 88% of them are overvalued. Now, what does overvalued mean? The word overvalued means it's not worth what it's priced at, right? You, it's a, you know, a $20 bill would be overvalued at $22. It's only worth $20. But if home prices are going to go up, that would mean the home is worth at least what somebody's paying for it. And if it's going to go up at an increasing rate of speed, well, that tells you it's really a good deal, right? That doesn't mean it's overvalued. It would mean, uh, I think, by definition, it's undervalued. I love this picture of Chairman Powell. I just, like all these people, they're the masters of the universe, making these decisions, running the government, predicting which rate rates to go, making billions of dollars, in this case, tens of millions of dollars off of his public service. But I love this picture of him putting something in his pocket. It almost looks like he just received his uh, payoff from Chase or B of A, and he's putting it in his pocket as he runs out of the meeting. He only gets a modest salary of $190,000 a year, meanwhile, worth tens of millions of dollars, determining how average Americans are being really taken advantage of with inflation. So overall, I would say that that article is uh, bad. But even worse, who are they quoting Fitch? Fitch is a rating agency. Rating agencies are kind of like, I think, the, the, uh, the mafia don of Wall Street and where the criminals, the Wall Street bankers who sell securities that are overinflated to, to unwitting customers and retirees, Need somebody to say these securities are good, are, are worth something. And Fitch, Moody's, and Standard Poor's are the three, uh, I think, the three musketeers in this system. And so here you have Fitch saying homes are overvalued, but the securities they market that are related to these mortgages, they're not going to call them anything but AAA. So they'll admit out loud that they're not good assets, but to get paid, they'll say whatever the customer requires them to say. If you ever saw the movie, um, Ooh, the uh, big short. There's a scene where they go see the lady uh, uh, at the rating agency. It's classic. I have a link down below in the email. But of, of all people to tell us where the market's headed, the last people we should be listening to is the rating agencies because they'll say anything. Their job is to sell the security that their customers paid them for. And I think they've really just been clowned themselves. So a lot of bad information being given to us. What should you do? Well, I always say that it's important for you to do what's best for you. If it's a good time for you to sell, then it's a good time to sell. If you can afford the property and lock in a good rate, then you can afford to buy something and enjoy the benefits of it for a long period of time on a real estate investment. If it cash flows, you can lock in a good rate. You can enjoy a great investment. And if rates ever do go down, get a free improvement as well. And if it's time for you to sell, cash out, 
You can get the money, put it in your pocket, and do something else with it, whether it be re relocate. If I can help you, let's get a plan together. Reach out to me, call, text, or email me, or reach out social media at Bill Gross Probate. If you like these videos, please like or subscribe. Uh, if, and if you have comments, put the comments there. I'd love to hear your feedback. If I can help in any way, I'm Bill Gross. Make today your best day ever. Thank you so much.